All right, we're going to get started here, folks. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for b joining us tonight. Uh, welcome uh, to a conversation about a sustainability investment fund. Uh, my name is Matt Flaherty. I'm an at-large member of the Bloomington City Council, uh, and I'm joined tonight up front by Lauren Travis, uh, who is the Assistant Director for Sustainability, Andrea Webster with IU's Environmental Resilience Institute, and Mayor John Hamilton. Um, and just to get a few preliminaries out of the way, talk about the agenda for the night. Um, we're gonna have about 25 or 30 minutes of presentations uh, just to give some background and context about why we're here. Uh, talk a little bit about sustainability and how that factors into the city's goals and our planning. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, the impacts that we will see here in Bloomington and Monroe County uh, under a changing climate. We're gonna have a few remarks from the mayor and then move on to the main portion of the evening, uh, which really 75% of this meeting is, is meant to highlight public input, to hear your ideas, uh, to take those ideas down and, and, um, and start collecting information, getting community input. Uh, so that part's vital, um, and it's gonna be organized around seven subject areas, um, which I'll go over in a little bit here, but we've got uh, subject matter experts on hand, mostly uh, from the city, department heads, and a few other folks from the community to help lead those conversations. Um, we'll have four 20-minute sessions that we kind of rotate, uh, but you're encouraged to, to move from table to table and float around as, as you see fit. But again, the, the point of those is to really get a conversation going about what the future holds for Bloomington and how to make sure that's an equitable and a sustainable future. So we're here again to listen and to discuss the idea of a sustainability investment fund and a change in the local income tax rate that could support that. Uh, so this was an idea that was proposed by Mayor John Hamilton on January 1st and uh, he added some more details to that at the State of the City address last month. And that, that can be viewed on CATS if you weren't there. Uh, but this isn't an entirely new idea in that uh, a lot of folks in the community, business, business folks, um, activists, county council members, others have been talking for some time at least about a, a local income tax to support transit. Just like our friends up in Marion County have done uh, since 2017. They've got a dedicated funding source to invest in a more sustainable transportation system uh, now underway. Uh, this conversation is a little broader. Uh, transit is certainly part of it, but we're talking about a, a sustainability investment fund more broadly. Uh, to, in, to invest in a better future, a more resilient economy, and a healthier community. Um, so why a dedicated sustainability investment fund? Uh, shortly, or, or in brief, we're, we're facing changes uh, in Bloomington, in Monroe County, that will impact our local economy and our community. We know that, uh, and we should prepare for those changes. Our residents have told us that we need to prepare uh, repeatedly in biannual city surveys and the development of city plans like the Comprehensive Plan, Transportation Plan, Sustainability Action Plan, as well as uh, actions from activists and advocates in the community and even our elected officials. Um, so yeah, it's a new thing. It's an emerging area that we need to focus on and uh, really invest in a, in a way that secures our future and protects those who are most vulnerable to these changes uh, while making sure that, that we're addressing people's needs today and trying to improve uh, the lives of our residents today too. So. Uh, a local income tax, or a LIT, is exactly that. It's an income tax paid by individuals at the local level. Um, you can see Monroe County's rates there. Uh, just by way of example, the half percent uh, change proposed by Mayor Hamilton for someone making $40,000 a year, that change would be $200 a year, or a little less than $4 a week. Uh, LIT revenues go to cities, towns, and counties, and those are divided proportionately based on population. Uh, so a half percent change in the Monroe County local income tax rate would generate about $16 million per year. About half of that, or a little more than half of that, would go to the city of Bloomington, with the other portions going based on population to Ellettsville, Steinsville, and the unincorporated uh, area portion of, of Monroe County uh, is the proportion. Um, whoops, wrong direction. We talked about that one. Uh, to put this in context a little bit more, uh, out of the 92 counties in Indiana, all of which have local income tax rates, we're the 22nd lowest, so we are a relatively low tax uh, city and, and county currently. Uh, you can see also some mid-sized Indiana cities there in the graphic, uh, just for a sake of comparison and, and getting a sense of where we are. Uh, you can see Columbus, for instance, at 1.75% or Terre Haute at 2%. Um, a local income tax, you know, begins by gathering public input and, and identifying community needs. And that's really the part of the process we're, sh we're starting in, in earnest here tonight, gathering public input, talking about what the anticipated needs of our community are um, over the next you know, decade and, and, and time to come. So ultimately, a tax, though, is passed by the Monroe County Local Income Tax Council. 
that body is made up of a, a collection of elected officials. So it's the city council from Bloomington, the Monroe County Council, the Ellettsville Town Council, and the Steinsville Town Council. Uh, and the voting share of that body is divided proportionately by population. So everybody's represented on that body, but it depends on where you live, which elected group is, is representing you based on the proportion of population again. Um, so both the amount of attacks and the timing of any vote is initiated by any uh, member of that body. Um, so it, it really is an open question still. Um, again, the proposal from Mayor Hamilton was for a half percent change, and uh, if that was voted in before September 1st of this year, that would go into effect October 1st of this year. Um, so I do want to address some common questions. Um, you know, the need for a dedicated fund, uh, again, in short, it's about planning for our future and addressing the impacts we know are coming our way, building a more resilient economy and community. Um, it, it was said well by Andrea actually yesterday that, that climate change is very expensive to respond to, but much lower cost to prepare for. And that's what we're trying to do here in Bloomington. Um, so uh, transparency and process and the measurement of success, all important pieces. So, uh, you know, we're getting started with the public engagement and public input process now. This is not the, the last meeting by any means, it's the beginning. So we also have other avenues, which I'll highlight in a minute, to, to engage and plug in. There will be more meetings to come. So getting the public involved in a really meaningful way uh, to discuss this, this idea is, is important. Uh, transparency and measuring success. If a fund is approved or passed, um, having that available on a dashboard, exactly where money's going, how decisions are being made, how the public will be involved in those decisions on an ongoing basis. Again, these are open questions. You're here to give your input on how that's gonna be done. Um, regarding equity concerns and tax burden, uh, when it comes to local income taxes, we don't have the power or ability to do a progressive tax that would be higher on higher income people. Rather, it's a percentage. So it affects everybody the same in that it's a, everybody pays the same percent. But of course we know uh, that lower income folks have less disposable income and thus are mo more vulnerable to any tax. Uh, and for that reason, it is the highest priority and absolutely essential that investments from this fund go to benefit uh, lower income folks and vulnerable people in our community. So investing in services like access to transit to really help people where there are gaps in our needs um, and lots of other things we can talk about at these sessions to come. Um, so why does climate change matter to Bloomington? Uh, first of all, because climate change impacts are local. They are local impacts. They are feelings, or things that we will, be, will feel here that we need to prepare for and address, uh, again, because it's vulnerable people in our community who will be impacted most by those. Um, and second, because while it's a global problem, it's very much a collective action problem. It takes communities like ours uh, and, and cities like Indianapolis and Cincinnati and Goshen and others around the state and region and, and uh, country that are stepping up to do their part. Uh, so when we can find those solutions, again, transit or, or other sustainable mobility options are an easy one to think about that help lower our carbon footprint, doing our part, while also helping people here and now, uh, that's what we're looking to do with, with any investments from a fund. Um, and finally, again, on the point of representation and, and, and how lit revenues are, are spread out, um, everybody in Monroe County is represented on the Local Income Tax Council. You're represented by whichever government entity uh, you live in. It's based on where you live. So if you live in the city of Bloomington, the Bloomington City Council is your representative. If you live in an unincorporated part of Monroe County, the Monroe County Council is your representative. Live in Ellettsville, town council is your representative. So just like we have two Indiana senators in the U.S. Senate, I don't vote for all 100 senators, but I do vote for two of them uh, who are there representing my interests. So, uh, and once again, um, the way lit revenues are distributed, it goes directly to the, the entity, the governmental entity that's over you. So if you don't live in Bloomington, um, no income tax dollars you pay will go to Bloomington City uh, uh, allocations. It would be to your government entity, whatever that is. Uh, but it's the process by which local income taxes are passed that this is collective nature between cities, towns, and counties. So I just wanted to explain that in a little more detail because I've seen some information out there that's a bit different. Um, finally, want to highlight more opportunities for input. Six days from today uh, in the evening, uh, Wednesday, March 11th, 6.30 p.m., uh, the Climate Action and Resilience Committee of the City Council, of which I'm the chair, um, is holding a, a meeting at 6.30. Um, it'll probably be somewhat similar to this, but a little different as well. We're gonna see how tonight goes and, and where there might be some gaps and other opportunities for people to give input. And if you couldn't make it to tonight, you can certainly make it to that one uh, if folks are watching on CATS later. Uh, also wanted to highlight the Sustainability Investment Fund FAQ page that's available on 
uh, the Bloomington City website, bloomington.in.gov slash sustainability. You can easily navigate to it from there. There is an online feedback form at the bottom, so you can leave additional feedback beyond what you're able to do today. And again, there will be more meetings and more ways to, to get engaged and plug in coming up. So finally, um, I'll go over the seven subject areas for our breakout topics. That'll be the bulk of the evening. Uh, we've got a public transit table led by two folks from Bloomington Transit to discuss uh, access to transit, transit in the community. Lou May just waved for us over there. He's the head of, longtime head of Bloomington Transit. Um, mobility options, we've got some planning and transporta transportation staff on hand uh, to talk about uh, access to transportation options in the community and, and making sure that we have safe and sustainable options like walking and biking for folks. Um, we've got a finance and economic equity table led by uh, some folks from the controller's office and um, that's a typo and it's totally my fault. Uh, Mr. McMillian is not with us, it's Kevin Curran <laughs> and Alex Crowley. Um, but, uh, and Alex Crowley with the Economic and Sustainable Development Department to talk about uh, all the details of city budgets, um, you know, how, how this tax would be implemented, if at all, um, and, uh, you know, if it's passed, I mean, and um, also how to make sure that we're prioritizing uh, equity in any decision making. We have a sustainable housing table. Um, that is headed up by Amber Scobie from Bloomington Housing Authority and also Dora Sims from the Housing and Neighborhood Development. Uh, so talking about where housing is located and how that lowers costs for folks, what types of housing we need, how to keep utility bills low, how to invest in energy efficiency, those types of questions. Um, local food is gonna be led by Council Member Dave Rallo uh, and as well as Rachel Byer, our local food system specialist. Uh, a green infrastructure table is led by uh, folks from Public Works, as well as City of Bloomington Utilities. That could be anything from stormwater infrastructure to utilities to managing the increased heat and air pollution that we'll see under a changing climate through uh, increased tree canopy or green roofs and this sort of thing. Um, planning for climate change ultimately will be the last table uh, headed by Lauren Travis and Andrea Webster, um, both experts on municipal sustainability and planning and adapting to a changing climate. Uh, so that's the structure for the, the evening after the presentations. I'll leave it there and turn it over to Lauren Travis. Thank you for joining us tonight. I wanted to note that if you would like a seat, there still are some seats in the audience for those of you that have just come in. As Matt mentioned, my name's Lauren Travis, and I have the pleasure to serve as the Assistant Director of Sustainability for the City of Bloomington. And I wanted to note, though, we won't have time today to talk about everything that's going on with the city and sustainability and climate planning. I will be at the table with Andrea over there, so if you want to talk about that in more detail, please find me after this. But First, I just wanted to talk about if we're proposing a sustainability investment fund, what does it actually mean to be a sustainable community and what is that as a value? And while there's oftentimes a real emphasis on environmental resiliency and improving environmental outcomes, that people and equity are really central to that as well. So looking at the visioning process that happened behind the comprehensive plan, um, sustainability really encompasses all of these areas, and so to be sustainable means that all of our residents must be able to make their, meet their basic needs, that they have equal access to high quality public services, and that they have equitable job opportunities, and we have an economy uh, that supports small businesses. And as well as some of the things that I work more closely on, which is making sure that we're reducing our pollution from emissions and then working with other departments and community members um, on some of the areas that will be featured in these tables. So I just wanted to note um, that this is reflected in the vision statement of our sustainability action plan, that the community came together and said that we want to be a leader on this and that that is exemplified by as a community saying that we will preserve our natural resources, maintain our culture, build a diverse and thriving economy, and ensure that everyone can have a healthy and equitable standard of living. So while that's a really important vision statement, it has a practical component of it in how can both our community and our county really ensure that the development that happens and the growth that will happen in upcoming years is enhancing our natural resources and that everyone is really experiencing the ability to provide for themselves. So just to talk about some unmet needs, we know that about 63% of all households in Bloomington currently are not able to afford basic necessities and some of those are reflected 
in the areas we're talking about, but uh, between 2012 and 2016, 6% more households in Bloomington were experiencing financial hardship, and this means that they are struggling with the ability to afford thing, basic needs like housing, childcare, food, healthcare, and transportation. And that indicates that we are having issues meeting sustainability concerns around economics and being able to ensure that people can sustain themselves and become economically viable. And it's incumbent upon us as Bloomington changes and grows that we are ensuring that these basic community needs are being met. And this could be one way that we meet some of those needs that are currently not being met in our community. Up here, very briefly, are some topic focus areas, which we'll discuss in more detail, but any investment in these areas um, would help improve economic, social, and environmental outcomes. One example, for instance, of how that could be experienced is by improving, for instance, insulation in buildings, which would reduce energy costs. It would reduce the amount of um, emissions associated with electric use in that building, and it would also um, ensure that more people are able to meet their heating needs. Um, and so this is just the beginning of a conversation, and I'm happy to have it with all of you about how we as representatives of your local government can continue to be responsive and forward thinking about the needs that we experience in this community. And um, this is just an open question of discussion that I'd like to get more input from all of you, but we're really looking to find ways that we can meet these sustainability and climate challenges, some of which will be discussed by Andrea, while also continuing to increase our efficiency and modernize our infrastructure. So I'm very happy to be able to serve in this role, and I'm looking to um, speak with as many of you as possible. And if you don't catch me now, please feel free to reach out after this. So I will hand it over to Andrea to talk about climate change. All right, well, thanks everybody. My name is Andrea Webster. I am the implementation manager at IU's Environmental Resilience Institute. Uh, at the Institute, our mission is to help prepare the state for climate change, uh, and that um, certainly includes Bloomington. So, to start, um, the big two climate impacts that we're concerned about in the state of Indiana are increasing temperatures uh, and increasing precipitation of events, so specifically rain and snow. And that's true across the state, and it is absolutely true here in Bloomington. So um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to spend a couple of slides explaining exactly what the specific impacts are to Bloomington, but I'm going to do that at a pretty high level. If you're interested in exploring that in more detail, uh, you can go to the Hoosier Resilience Index, which is just a website which, post, which is posted there, uh, and you can find much more information uh, that's specific to the climate change impacts here in town. So. Scientists in Indiana are projecting that by the 2050s, the number of high heat days and nights that Bloomington will experience will triple. Uh, so that's pretty significant. And we care about, I think we all know why we care about high heat days, um, but high heat nights is a little bit more nuanced. So as temperatures increase at night, so for example, if we are, uh, if our bodies are not able to cool down because temperatures haven't gotten below 68 degrees for several nights in a row, then the number of people going to visit the emergency room increases. Uh, and you may be thinking, uh, well, I have air conditioning. How does that matter? Well, maybe there are other people in our community that don't have access to that air conditioning. So there's some planning that the city can do um, with the community to make sure that those people are able to cool down at night. So the numbers that we're looking at on this slide tell us how many extreme precipitation events we can expect on average per decade by the 2050s. So while the numbers you see don't appear to increase that much, there are two things you need to remember. Indiana is getting more precipitation in the winter and the spring and less in the summer and fall, which means that all of our rain events are gonna be more concentrated into a fewer months per year. Secondly, so that fact combined with more water falling overall, so you can see uh, in the state impacts over here that Monroe County is expected to see an increase um, 
in precipitation of 8.1 inches of more rain and snow per year on average. So, um, so this leads me to think that we really need to be prepared for larger precipitation events. So this is a screen, uh, a, a map of Bloomington, which again, you can get on the Resilience Index uh, website. But it's nice because uh, if you go on there, you can actually see where the floodplain is in Bloomington. And when I say floodplain, I'm specifically talking about areas next to rivers and streams that are more likely to flood during heavy rain events. Uh, and so you can turn on an aerial view, which is just like you see on Google Maps. You can zoom in, you can look at your house, and you can see uh, where the floodplain is in relation to where you live, where you work, and where you visit in your community. So um, the other thing I want to mention on this slide is that there are two types of flooding that occur in a community. One is river flooding, which you can see here, and another one is surface flooding, and it's often called nuisance flooding because that's the flooding that we see popping up in our streets and in our basements and occasionally in our first floors, uh, and that's the stuff we want to avoid as well. So uh, when we're talking about flooding in developed areas from streams and rivers, particularly. Bloomington has 634 acres of land in the floodplain total. 465 of those acres have developed, are developed. So they have roads, they have houses, they have playgrounds, they have businesses. Uh, so that's not good because when, when that stuff floods, then we have economic impacts and we have very heavy community impacts. Um, Wetlands, however, we have 112 acres of wetlands in the, in the floodplain in Bloomington, and that's great. So we want to make sure that those floodplains, th I'm sorry, that those wetlands are healthy and that they can um, retain that water because wetlands are made to function, uh, they're not ma maybe made to function, but they do function as great ecosystems to hold water and retain more water when we get it. So the more healthy wetlands that we have, the better. So. Next, I want to talk a little bit about why all of this matters. And it matters because the extreme heat and extreme precipitation that we're experiencing leads to other problems as well. So high temperatures combined with the pollution that comes out of our tailpipes as we're driving our cars around, that combines to form smog. And that leads to poor air quality, which leads to health impacts, which can lead to premature deaths. Uh, so we need to take this stuff seriously. Extreme heat nights, uh, as I mentioned before, can also lead to premature deaths because we have more pe people visiting the emergency room because of heat illnesses. Increasing precipitation is, um, this is a very messy slide because there are a lot of things that happen as a result of increasing precipitation. So um, increasing precipitation can lead to increased mosquito populations, a higher chance of household flooding, which can lead to mold, which leads to indoor air quality issues. Um, and then we also can see economic impacts if, other, if our storm sewers aren't large enough to hold the amount of water that needs to flow through them. So this is all quite a bit dire, um, but the good news is that there are actually things we can do about this um, that other communities are already starting to do as well. So specifically uh, for extreme heat, uh, we all are all very familiar with towns having plans in place when we have a blizzard coming through. And now we can make a plan for when there's a heat wave coming through. In terms of flooding, we can prepare our culverts and ditches to make sure that our streets and storm drains stay clear. We can add green infrastructure. So if we add rain gardens and plants to absorb that rainwater on site, uh, that's all the better. And we should put as much green infrastructure and plants and trees in as many places as we can. Um, the last thing I'll mention, and this is a particularly expensive one, is to make sure that our storm sewers are ready to hold that larger amount of water because those storm sewers were built when, at a time when we were not getting this much rain and they were built at certain capacities that we are exceeding around the state of Indiana and across the Midwest more than we ever thought we would. So, um, but this is a hard one and it impacts our community a lot when we're digging up streets to put in more sewers. So um, it's certainly something to think about. But communities that are prepared to and invest up front are going to fare way better in the long run. So um, those are my comments. And next, I'm going to pass it over to the mayor uh, to say a few words.
that's my slideshow right there. So that's it. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, thank you, Matt and Lauren and Andrea, for wonderful comments and information. Thank you all for being here, uh, being part of this discussion. And uh, uh, we're going to get right to the tables very soon. I just want to make a couple comments. One, we are starting the decade of the 2020s. We are in the decade of the 20s. What we look like 10 years from now by 2030 is incredibly important. These next 10 years, what kind of community we will be during these next 10 years to, to decide what we're going to look like at 2030 is incredibly important. I think I'm trying to hear what are the values of this community, and you've seen demonstrations of values and references to our values as a community. We want a green community. We want an equitable community. We want an inclusive community. We want to do our part to make sure that this planet and our piece of this planet is livable for, for all of us 10 years from now and 30 years from now and 50 years from now. I believe our values also say to us, we want to make sure as this community changes and evolves that we have a place for everybody. That we don't leave people behind as, as these changes happen. And, I'm, and here's the good news. This stuff is challenging. These are, big these are big challenges, but here's the good news. The good news is if we invest in this stuff, to improve our community in this way. I believe we will have a community that is so much better than it is today for so many people. It will be a community that reflects our values much more, that, that does our place for the rest of the world, does our part of it, but that also is just a great, greater community to live in with better transit, with much better ways to get around, with a higher quality of life for many more of us people who don't live here yet, who are going to live here, that this, this actually is a huge opportunity to, over the next 10 years, to create a community that will be an incredibly powerful statement of, wow, this is actually really good stuff to do. This makes our quality of life better for all of us. The housing, the green infrastructure, the transit, the local food, the buildings, the changes in our energy use, all these things are like actually really good for us. They can be challenging, but they're really good for us. So what, so what we need for you to help us do is think about what, are, what is more important among all these things. A, a 50 cent on $100 of income is not nothing. It's, it's, it's real, and it will cost money. We will still be a low-tax city after we pass this. I hope we do pass it. We will still be a low-tax city in the red conservative state of Indiana. Just remember that. It's not like this is an incredible thing to do, but it is a serious down payment on becoming the kind of community that I think we really want to be. And I hope you'll help us think about what's more important, transit, green infrastructure, housing. How should we balance that? That's what we really need to think about, and how should we address this? So uh, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to stick around. I'm not going to be at any one table, but if you want to come talk to me, I'll be hanging out. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll join me. I know Matt's going to close it, but these are three really smart people who've helped think about this, so thank them, and we'll get to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton. I'll also, yes, yeah, stick around and be available to talk, um, if not at one table, but just up front. Uh, if people have questions that are sort of outside the purview of any of these conversations that are wonderful subject matter experts and volunteers are now going to lead. Uh, I'll put this back up just to have uh, a reminder of what tables uh, are available. And we'll go ahead and get started on the next few minutes uh, and try to keep a, a fairly tight timer on 20 minute sessions. But again, float around as you see fit and we'll uh, kind of make an announcement every 20 minutes. Maybe you want to switch. Right, exactly. Yeah, we'll move the tables to get a little more space in there and maybe just grab a chair and bring it with you. Or if you're capable of grabbing a couple, go ahead and do that. Grab yourself a cookie while you're at it. Thank you. <laughs>